All right, what's poppin'? It's your boy, Big Rich. Monday afternoon business. Just rolled up a little bit of tangerine biscuit. You know how we do in Queens. And we're going to do a mob spotlight. You know, we haven't done a mob spotlight in a while. I thought maybe it may be time for one. Going through my emails of uh, stuff that people sent me, and I found this article that someone sent me. And I said, you know, let's do this one, right? So this is the mob spotlight. You light up, throw some smoke in the atmosphere. Gentlemen, you know the routine. Wipe your feet on the rug. Let's get right into business. Tommy Karate Patera. Born December 2, 1954, is a former mafia hitman in the Bonanno crime family. Patera, reputedly a vicious and sadistic killer who enjoyed murdering people, was suspected by law enforcement of as many as 60 murders. Patera was well known for his use of karate and other martial arts when fighting, a skill he had learned at a young age. It earned him the nickname Tommy Karate. Tommy grew up in Gravesend neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York, salute to parents Joseph and Catherine Patera. Thomas attended the David A. Booty Jr. High School in Gravesend, where he left little impression with his teachers and was bullied by his peers. As a child, Patera had been a huge fan of the 1966 The Green Hornet television show and actor Bruce Lee, triggering his lifelong interest in martial arts. After winning a competition in Sheep's Head Bay, Patera spent 27 months in Japan training under the Reverend Hiroshi Masumi. He was trained to use the tanfa, nunchucks, and katanas. While in Japan, he grew his hair down to his shoulders to adopt the Bruce Lee image. After his scholarship ended, he sought work in a chopsticks factory to underwrite his stay and earn more money. This led him to acquire the nickname Tommy Karate by friends and fellow mobsters. Upon returning to Brooklyn, Patera joined the Bonanno crime family and quickly became one of the most feared soldiers. He belonged to a Bonanno faction headed by Capo regimes Alphonse Sonny Red Indelicado, Frank Lino, Dominic Trinchera, and Philip Giacconi. Tommy Patera came up and was trained by Anthony Bruno in Delicato, a.k.a. Whack Whack. Anthony Bruno in Delicato used to dip his bullets in cyanide. He was convicted of killing Carmine Lilo Galante in one of the most famous mob hits of all time during the 1986 New York City Commission trial. Anthony Bruno in Delicato was the son of slain Bonanno captain Alphonse Sonny Red in Delicato. This group opposed the current leadership under boss Philip Ristelli and his leading capos Joseph Massino and Dominic Napolitano. In 1981, Massino and Napolitano set up the murders of three rival capos in a Gravesend club co-owned by Sammy Gravano. After their deaths, Massino made peace with the rest of the leaderless faction, including Patera. During the 1980s, Tommy became a made man of the Bonanno family and was assigned to Lino's crew by Bonanno conciliari Anthony Spero. On August 29, 1988, Tommy allegedly ambushed and murdered Wilfred Willie Boy Johnson as he walked ahead to their car. Johnson had been a longtime associate and driver for Gambino family boss John Gotti. The hit was reportedly delegated to Tommy and fellow gunman Vincent Kojak Giatino after Gotti had discovered that Johnson had been a government informant since 1966. A disgrace. Tommy was charged with the Johnson murder but acquitted at trial. Tommy was close to Sparrow, whose Bath Beach crew were involved in extortion, loan sharking, drug dealing, and murder, as well as robbing drug dealers and then reselling their product. Tommy's associates, Lloyd Modell and Frank Martini, murdered two Colombian drug dealers and stole 16 kilograms of cocaine. The killers intended to drive their car to Staten Island to bury the bodies, but as they could not drive a stick shift, they left the car with the bodies inside the trunk in a Brooklyn parking garage. Modell used one of Tommy's guns in the murder and threw it in the bay, angering him. Tommy killed Tala Siksik, a Middle Eastern drug supplier, in his Brooklyn apartment. Tommy shot Siksik four times in the back, chopped up the body into six pieces, and then buried it at a secret dumping ground. Investigators eventually found six of Patera's victims in a mob graveyard in Staten Island near the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge. Tommy had decapitated the bodies and buried the heads separately to impede their identification using dental records. 
Tommy's approach to murder and body disposal was cold-hearted and clinical. He used the Staten Island graveyard because he believed that the damp soil would accelerate decomposition and the federal refuge would ensure the bodies were not discovered during construction projects. Tommy studied books on dissection and carried a special toolkit for cutting up the bodies. He always insisted on burying corpses deep enough so that the police dogs could not locate their scents. Before burying body parts, Tommy either wrapped them in plastic or placed them in suitcases. Tommy's weakness was that he enjoyed keeping jewelry and other souvenirs of his work. This went beyond mafia culture and was classic serial killer behavior. On June 4, 1990, Tommy was indicted for heading a drug dealing crew for his involvement in seven murders, including the 1988 Johnson murder. Investigators alleged that Tommy had been involved in as many as 60 murders. Pitera's crew sold about 220 pounds of cocaine per year, multiple kilos of heroin, and hundreds of pounds of marijuana. FBI agents discovered more than 60 automatic weapons, knives, swords, and literature such as the Hitman's Handbook and Killed or Be Killed, which dealt primarily with assassination techniques as well as torture and the dismemberment of cadavers in Tommy's apartment in Gravesend, Brooklyn. During the trial... One of Tommy's crew members, Frank Ganji, the nephew of Genovese crime family captain Rosario Ganji, decided to testify against Tommy. A disgracian. Frank had been arrested for driving under the influence and allegedly started reliving Tommy's worst atrocities in his mind while sitting in the holding cell. Frank confessed to all the murders he was involved in with Tommy and provided information on other Tommy's murders. Frank described how Tommy matter-of-factly assassinated his girlfriend, Phyllis Birdie, while she was passed out in bed after sharing cocaine and sex with Frank. Tommy then cut Birdie's corpse into six pieces in the bathroom. Frank also testified that during a fight with a drug dealer named Marek Kucharski, Tommy pulled a knife and repeatedly stabbed Kucharski and finally cut his throat. Also, Philip Carlo writes that Shlomo Mendelssohn, an Israeli drug dealer, said the bodies were buried on Staten Island or New Jersey. In Tommy's trial, the chief prosecutor, David Shapiro, demanded a death sentence for the heinous, cruel, and depraved murders committed by Tommy. He called Tommy a heartless and ruthless killer, explaining in detail how he tortured one victim by slowly, deliberately shooting him seven times in various body parts in one of a series of murders carried out in a deliberately barbaric manner. The prosecution also produced a DEA agent who testified to digging up graves containing the dismembered bodies of some of Tommy's victims. Tommy's defense lawyer, David A. Runke, urged the jury to reject the death penalty on the grounds that Tommy had no prior criminal record and other participants in the murders were allowed to plead guilty to lesser charges. Moreover, only two of the murder victims, Richard Leone and Solomon Stern, were killed on March 15, 1989, after the federal death penalty law went into effect. The four other murders took place earlier, so those counts carried maximum sentences of life in prison. Tommy's aunt, sister-in-law, and two cousins testified on Tommy's defense that he was a loving and caring family member. On July 25, 1992, Tommy was convicted of murdering six people and supervising a massive drug dealing operation in Brooklyn. However, Tommy was acquitted in the 1988 Johnson murder. During the deliberation on sentencing, the jury rejected the death penalty for Tommy. In October of 1992, alluding to evidence that Tommy brutally killed his victims and dismembered their bodies, Judge Rena Raji sentenced him to life in prison, saying, Mr. Patera, nobody deserves to die as these people died. First of all, salute to whoever sent me this uh, well put together article. I uh, don't know where it's from, but if I find out, I will give it its proper respect. Salute, Mob Spotlight. Like, comment, share. Let me know what you're smoking on. And always keep it business. Salute.